Hi, John here. Let's use a couple of UNO cards to discuss how sorting algorithms work. So what do we got here? We have six cards, right? Well, let's spread them out and see what we got. So these are basically in random order. Let's assume that these values will be stored in an array in a running program that we want to write so that it can sort these in ascending order. Another the smallest one on the left, the largest one on the right. Now, intuition tells us a number of things right off the bat. We can clearly see each of these cards has a single digit face value. In your mind, you know that even if you don't look at any other card, let's say these are all upside down like this, right? If we flipped over one single card and didn't know anything about the values of any other of these cards, other than the fact that they all have a single digit face value and you saw that this was an eight, you'd know intuitively that it probably needs to be over on the right somewhere. If you flip over another card too, you know intuitively that's gonna go on the left. Why? Because if they're all single digit cards, you got zero through nine are the only possible values. Therefore, most likely th th this has to go on the left. You wouldn't put it over here on the right, right? Okay, so like for now, let's forget all of our intuitions that our brains tell us when it comes to manually sorting these things, okay? So if we're going to write a piece of code to do this, we need to think in terms of every little step that's going on here, all right? Let's start by laying some simple ground rules here. What we want to do is sort the array such that the left side represents sorted values and the right side represents the remaining unsorted values. Okay, so in other words, let's find the smallest one in here and move that one furthest over to the left. So that obviously is the two. We can actually run through here. We can kind of mentally say, well, again, if you don't look at any cards except for the first one, when you're only looking at one card, by definition, it is the smallest because it's the only one. As you look at increasing cards, you can say to yourself, oh, this one's smaller than that one. So maybe I'll swap these around, okay? And now you can keep on going and say, oh, there's a five. You might want to swap these two as you go, all right? And you get an eight, you say, oh, that one's in the right position. You get a three, and you'd say, well, what am I going to do about this? Maybe I'd pull this one down, slide these over, and move it back up like that. And then we look at the last one and a nine, and we're looking at a fully ordered array of these cards. Now, how would you codify that, right? Well, it's not immediately obvious. Let's resort these and then attempt to heighten our awareness of what we're doing as we go. All right, so same basic idea. Let's assume that we want to make the sorted cards be on the left side of the array as we incorporate new values on the right. So what could we do? Let's try to minimize the cost of doing the sorting, right? So we start by comparing the 7 and the 2, and we say, well, 2 is less than 7, so let's remember that two looks like a good candidate to be the smallest card. And let's compare that to the nine. Well, two still looks pretty good. Let's compare it to five, still looks pretty good. Compare it to the eight, looks good. Compare it to the three, still looks good. All right, so what we've done is we found the smallest card in the entire array on this, what we'll call first pass. We can then swap these two cards and state that the deck now has one sorted element followed by five unsorted elements. We know this is sorted, and we know it by definition that means it's the smallest value of the entire array. We don't need to really look at that anymore. We can start over here again with the seven and just consider the remaining part of the array. So what we've done is we've said we want to sort this whole array. We're going to do it one at a time. Now let's sort what remains. Okay, do the same thing. We'll just assume this is the smallest card of the remaining cards, and then one at a time, check them again. Is seven less than nine? Yeah, this is a good choice to be on the left of the nine or where it's at. Is seven less than five? Well, no, not really. So we have to now consider this to be the best candidate to put into this position over here. Is five less than eight? Yeah, it's still a best candidate to put over here. Is five less than three? No, this is now our best candidate to be put in the position where that seven is, right? Now, we've run out of cards, so there's nothing else to compare. What do we do? We do the same thing we did the first time. We can swap these two values. Now we know the first two elements of, of the array have been sorted. The remaining elements have not been sorted. And we can then just advance our 
algorithm and do the exact same thing again. Start over here and say this, by definition, is the best candidate that of the cards we've looked at so far. So let's look at the, this one here. Is this less than nine? Yeah, so this is the best candidate now to be over there. Is uh, uh, eight less than five? No, five is still good. Is seven less than five? Nope, five is still good. We've found the smallest value in the remaining card. So we swap that. And now we advance to say the first three have been sorted. The remaining three need to still be sorted. And we do the same thing again. We say, well, the first of the remaining three is a nine. That's our best option. Is eight less than nine? Yeah, no, that's our best option, right? Is seven less than eight? Yeah. Oh, no, seven now is our best option. We've run out of cards. We can now say, well, let's swap these two and move on to the remaining two cards. Now, this is the first in the remaining set. We'll just declare that the best that we've seen so far. And then we check it against all the other ones, like nine. Is nine less than eight? No, there's nothing to do. Okay, we can then advance our our gaze onto the very last card, but we don't really need to do that. You never have to sort an array of one element. So once you've done this for the last two, you're done. All right, so now let's take a step back and think about what we had to keep track of to do this. There's three things we need to keep track of. Let's use these pens to represent those three things. What we need to do is we need to remember how much of the array remains to be sorted. That's our red pen, okay? We need to remember what the smallest face value is of all the cards we've checked so far. That's the yellow pen. Then we need to keep track of which card we want to check against the smallest ones that we've seen so far. So let's go ahead and reshuffle our deck a little bit and put these cards back up in some sort of random order. Five, uh, let's, uh, that's a nine. We'll put them over here just so there's something to do here, right? Now let's label these so we can refer to them more easily. Let's call this element zero, element one, element two, element three, element four, and element five. We say the total number of elements is six, and they are labeled, or their indices of their values are zero through five, okay, for a total of six values. All right, now, now we're cooking. This red pen is gonna iterate from zero to four, or more accurately, up to n, which is six, minus two okay, inclusively. So zero to four for this guy. When we started, the first thing we did is we said, let's look at the first card. Let's remember that's the smallest one we've seen so far. And then we have another pointer that's going to iterate across all of these elements in the array, starting with the first one to the right of the red pointer here, okay? So then we begin. Is the value stored in the element represented by the black pointer less than the value of the element stored at the index that's stored in the where the yellow pen is marking? And the answer is yes. So we remember that element one is the less, smallest one we've seen so far. And then we advance the black pointer to number two over here. Is the value at element number two less than the value at Element one, no, advance the pointer. Is the value at element three less than the value at element one? No, advance the pointer. Is the value at element four, three, less than the value at element one, which is two? No, you advance this pointer. Is the value at element five less than the value at element one? No, it is not. When the black pointer has reached the end, we now say, let's swap the values that are being, uh, that are stored at the indices in the red and the yellow markers. So that's these two, we simply swap them, all right? Then you advance the red marker and you reset your yellow marker, which happens to be pointing here by coincidence, to the, uh, the, the, the remaining set of your array. You then move the black pointer back to red pointer plus one right here, and you do the exact algorithm again. Seven is the smallest value we've seen so far. Now is the value at the black pointer less than the value at the yellow pointer. Yes, it is. We move the yellow pointer over, and then we move the black one over. Is the value at the black pointer less than the value at the yellow pointer? Yes, it is. We move this over again. Now we advance this guy, 
you ask, is the value of the black pointer less than the value of the yellow pointer? Yes, it is. You remember now that's the smallest one again uh, seen so far. And you advance the black pointer and you say, hey, is the value of the black pointer less than the value at the yellow pointer? No, it is not. You advance the black pointer and you notice now we're done. What do you do when we're done? We swap the values at the red and yellow pointers, right? So these two here become swapped. And we move on to the next iteration. So the red pointer is now moved over to here. This is actually a nine. I have this thing upside down. You can see that is a nine, not a six. Uh, sorry for that confusion. Anyway, we reset for the next time by advancing the red pointer, set the yellow pointer to the same value as the red pointer, and setting the black pointer to red pointer plus one. And we note that this is the smallest value that we have seen so far. And we then begin our next pass over the remaining elements. Is the value of the black pointer less than the value of the yellow pointer? Yes, it is. You move the yellow pointer over. And then you iterate uh, to the next element uh, in the black pointer. Is the black pointer value less than the one in the yellow? No, it is not. You advance the black. Is the value at five less than the value at three? No, it is not. So we're now done, right? Boom. Now what do you do? You swap these two because the yellow and reds get swapped at the end of every pass. You now move over the red pointer, reset the yellow to the same value that the red one has. You start iterating again, and you ask, is the value stored at 4 less than the value stored at 3? And the answer is yes, so you remember that you need to swap this guy. And you advance the black pointer, and you say, is the value stored at 5, which is 8, less than the value stored at 4? And the answer is no. This one's done. What do you do? You swap the elements, you advance the red pointer. Remember, we're going to go up to n minus 2. This is going to be our last pass, and that makes sense, right? There's only two cards left. You reset, and you put the black pointer at the index 1 past the red pointer, and you start again, and you ask, is the value stored at the black pointer less than the value stored at the, uh, the, the yellow pointer? And the answer is yes, so you move this thing over. The black pointer is now done because it ran off the end. You're at the bottom of the, your your iteration loop and you know you need to swap these two cards now this has become done and we know that we have a completely sorted array all right so let's re uh shuffle the deck a little bit bird's eye view here what did we learn well what happens is when you set up this specific algorithm what you're really doing when you're comparing the magnitudes of each one of these elements against the smallest one known so far, right? You're going to do this. You're going to remember that's less than the 7, and then you're going to compare it against this one, and then this one, oh, that's less. So you remember that one, and you go on here. No, that's not less. No, that's not less. When we're done with the inner loop here, when the black iterator is done, we have selected, we say, the smallest element value and we can then make the swap, right? So this is what we call a selection sort. So if we were to codify the algorithm we just went over, for the selection sort, what do we know? What do we need to know? We need to have the array of all the values, that's the deck of cards, and we need to know how many cards there are in that deck. So that's your six in this example, okay? Let's look at this algorithm, right? What are we doing? We say i equals zero. That's our red pen. This is going to make one pass from the far left element, not quite over to the far right end. Remember, we wanted to go to n minus 2 and stop. Look at how this has been coded while n, or while i rather, is less than n minus 1. That means if we ignore the entire body of this loop, if we run the program and we just look at i in this while loop, what do we know about i? It will iterate starting at the value 0. When it reaches the value of n minus 1, this expression here becomes false, and we stop executing the body of the loop. We fall out down here, and we end the procedure. So that means i will go from 0 to n minus 2 inclusively. All right. Now let's look at the body of the loop. This is where we're playing around with the black pen and remembering the smallest one we've seen so far and so on. Well, min index is the variable we're going to use to remember the smallest one we've seen so far. And as you saw, we set it equal to what the red pen 
was pointing at. Well, remember, I is our red pen. So the first thing we're going to do is say, just assume the first one is the smallest. That's what this does. J now is our black pen. J starts one pass the red pen. Okay? Now we execute this inner loop here. Well, J is less than N. Well, this means what? What do we know then of the black pen? The black pen will start one pass the the current value in the red pen, right? And it will go all the way up to n minus 1, because it has to be less than n. And when this while loop completes, j will equal n, right? And once j becomes equal to n, this becomes false, and the loop ends, right? Okay, so then this loop body runs. Well, this is the logic that compares the value that the black pen was pointing at. Remember, j is our black pen uh, variable. And we're going to ask, is the value that the black pen is pointing at less than the value that the yellow pen was pointing at? If so, we set the yellow pen equal to the current value of the black pen, just like we saw in the walkthrough with the cards. Otherwise, we don't do anything at all. We already have the smallest one so far, right? At the end of this loop, we're going to advance the black pen over to the right and come back to reevaluate. Did the black pen get to the far right? Okay, that's all we need to do. This provides the selection that needs to take place. When we're done with all that, we are going to swap the value that we found, the smallest one, right, which is where the yellow pen was pointing, with the value in the array that is at where the red pen is pointing to. Here's where we move the red pen to the right one unit, and we end this loop, okay? And then we ask, did the red pen run over beyond n minus 2? Are we still less than n minus 1? If so, we then set the black pen and the yellow pen and we do another search for the smallest item and we do another swap all right this is exactly how this algorithm works now you might notice that there could be certain optimization taking place here why do you want to swap these two values here if the red pen and the yellow pen are pointing at the same item right so there's an optimization you probably want to do in other words you'll say if i is not equal to min index in this specific pseudocode, then don't do this. Otherwise, do do this, okay? That's just off the top of my head. I noticed that that is something you want to do. All right, now th this particular web page, which I'll link to under the video, is a another walkthrough just like the cards, okay? But you don't get to see it animated. This is why I moved the cards around and stuff like that. So here's another example. This time we're going to sort eight elements, right? Zero through seven for a total of eight elements. And you can see in here the blue uh, values represent the portion of the array that has been sorted and we refer to these things as passes. We make a pass over the array and we say, all right, after the first pass, the passes the black marker has scanned through all these elements. Once that's been done, we know the smallest value in the entire array will have been placed in element zero. We no, no longer need to consider that value when we search for the next smallest value and so on. All right, so this thing shows you that um, I here, as it iterates to the right, uh, looking for the smallest one and then swapping it into the current location of I and then you do it again and again and again. All right. So what do we know about this? We know that the time complexity is on the order of N squared, right? Because when we did these loops, this loop here, granted, it goes from I plus one to N it still executes that roughly n times. This starts looking like n squared. This is what we call the time complexity on the order of n squared. We can also ask about the space complexity, right? Well, how much extra memory does it take to run this algorithm? Well, we know that we only need one storage area to perform the swap operation, you know, to hold a temporary variable. And we know that we need to keep track of the three different index values. So you could say this is on the order of some constant number that has no relationship to the number of elements. So that's order one. 
Now, if we look at this in contrast to other sorts, we can make an observation that the total number of swap operations is on the order of n. That's the worst case scenario. If the thing is absolutely backwards and every time you make a pass you have to do a swap, you need to do n minus 1 quite literally swaps. So you're doing on the order of n swaps. And if the array is completely sorted before you run this algorithm, and you make the optimization that I mentioned here, in other words, don't swap it if you don't have to, then you make no swaps at all, okay? Now, uh, the observation down there is, you know, if the swapping operation is costly, in other words, if the values in this array are not just integers, but they're very large and complex objects, these could be megabyte-sized things in memory, you don't want to be copying these things around unnecessarily. So this can actually make a big difference depending on the sizes of these various elements. So when you choose the algorithm you want to use to perform a sorting operation, you need to keep in mind whether or not your things are mostly or entirely possibly pre-sorted or not, whether or not swapping is harder to do than simply comparing, and so on. You need to be cognizant of which of these operations is most expensive. Do you need to minimize your memory? Do you need to minimize the time? Do you need to minimize the uh, number of comparisons you do? Or can you just do a lot of comparisons and you don't care as long as you do a minimum number of swapping operations, all right? So this is what we're getting into when we talk about the complexity, all right? And this observation down here. So that is how the selection sort algorithm can be implemented. See you next time.